I think the most important thing is the connection and the integration of strands like the system symbols and behaviors. We often think that we can solve a problem just by exhorting behavior or training people to be better listeners and so and I'm not denigrating that at all but sometimes think once we've done that we've solved it or we solve it by just changing the system or we solve it by designing a new logo or having a new vision and mission statement and those things in themselves are only useful if they're connected to the other things so it's the, the leadership work to integrate those together rather than just try on one stream and then become disappointed that that doesn't last. It is a pleasure to, to introduce um, Ian MacDonald and, and to welcome Ian uh, back to Wales. Uh, Ian's got a long-standing Welsh family connections with Wales um, and in 1980 um, Ian uh, led an all-Wales strategy for community services that looked at uh, realignment around mental health uh, provision, health provision and the closures of large hospitals and he actually gained his gliding license across our beautiful landscape here in Wales as well so, so very welcome back. Um, Ian is a chartered uh, psychologist and graduated from Brunel University in 1972. He established Macdonald Associate Consultancy in 1983 and has worked across the world in, in that capacity in Russia, Canada, USA, Scandinavia and Australia included. Ian has co-authored Systems and Leadership, Creating Positive Organisations, and I know he's going to go on and talk around symbols, process, and identity, and connection, and about create, creating space for people to flourish um, and using their capacity within organisations as well. Like I said, I describe leadership as a bag of jelly. Um, every time I grab it and I think I've got hold of it, there's another uh, search on Google or Amazon, and there are other websites available, I know. Um, but it is also to uh, reassure him when I've read some of Ian's work is that he's described leadership as a bit faddish, like dieting. So without further ado, can I introduce you, Ian MacDonald. Thanks very much, and um, also thank you very much for inviting me here. It's, it's a real privilege to be here and to share this time with you, and I hope the next hour or so will be useful to you. Um, I've got a lot of family connections with regard to the public service. Uh, my wife, my three daughters, and two son-in-laws are all in the public service, and I'm pretty well aware of how at times unappreciated they are. And, how hard they have to work. In fact, my, uh, one of my son-in-laws in the London Fire Brigade. Um, what I want to talk about today is, is systems leadership. And uh, some of you will have heard of this term, and it's, it's used pretty generally. But at the heart of it, that's what it's about. And it's very much what Hugh was talking about there, what he tries to do in leading an organisation, in creating those conditions. Uh, I was struck some years ago, as, as Hugh said, I've had the opportunity of working in a lot of countries around the world. And I was, um, actually was in another country some time, and I was coming down in a, a, a lift from a, a large building, in a large building, coming down, and there was a young person, relatively young person, well, everyone's relatively young to me now, but um, there was a young person in there, and coming down the lift, and as the doors opened, it was a Friday evening, and as the doors opened, he just said, oh, another week. And it was just a whole sense of as if work was a sentence for him. And, um, and another occasion, I was talking to somebody who wasn't enjoying their work, middle management role. And the person I says, why don't you just leave? Should you leave the organisation? And he just says, oh, I've got another 10 years before I can get my full pension. Right? And you think about how much time you know, we spend in work if it's not an enjoyable place to be, if it's not somewhere where we feel that we're using our creativity, where we're being productive, that's a pretty visible amount of time to spend. And systems leadership is based on the assumption, it's a very important assumption, that all of us are actually naturally creative and productive people. That given the opportunity, we will use our capability constructively. 
and that there's a great inner drive to do that. And so when we look at organisations, we're looking at what is it then that stops us? You won't, if you, any of you have an opportunity to look at the book or any of our materials, you won't see the word motivation in there. I believe people are inherently self-motivated. And the big evidence for that, my background in psychology, the biggest evidence for that, who's got children? All right. If, if you're fortunate enough to have a, have a child that's, that's well and healthy and so on, you don't have to encourage them to do things. They're just full on. No wonder they sleep so much when they're little. You know, they wake up and they're just at it straight away, exploring. They're not getting paid. They don't, they don't, they're not doing it because they get an extra grade if they achieve this. That, you know, so naturally, I think human beings are very creative and very productive. But we don't always create the conditions. <coughs> and when I was thinking about that, have a think for yourselves. It'd probably be very different for everybody in this room. Where, where do you get your ideas of what is a good organisation? Okay. Where did that come from? What do you assume to be, if you were to write down what are the three components of a good organisation, or the five, or whatever, I would, I would expect, it's not a criticism, but I'd expect people would write some very different things. Okay? But if you think about other areas, we have much more of a background in terms of defining or understanding what is a good, what is a good vehicle? What is a, if you go and buy a car, you have significant expectations of what that means and, and how it should perform. Okay, if you go into a hospital and you're having an operation, you might have an idea about what constitutes a good operation and, and good... But organisations, we're often asked to rely on experience, what we've learnt from somebody or from many of the books, as, as Hugh said, that are often quite faddish. And that's why I, this, these few days here, the summer school, winter school and so on, I think are very good <coughs> opportunities to explore those ideas about what you consider to be a good organisation. Because there may be very different views, and if you're going to build a culture, there should be some commonality in that, in the, also the way you were talking, Hugh, just recently about what it is in the fire service. Okay. So, as I say there, that if you, if you want to become rich in this field, the thing is, you, you could write a book. You could write a book, but if you do write a book, what you have to have is you have to have a single number to start off with, the single number, and then something about secrets or so on to become forever sec successful and in brackets without having to do any work. <laughs> because that's the same as saying like with diet, it's like how many books are there on that? And it's about just eat less and exercise more. But the but there's so much which is often inviting us to think that there are shortcuts. But I think most people know from their own experience there are not a lot of shortcuts in terms of just understanding it is actually hard work. I was working with one of the big consultancy companies recently and I got given a piece of advice from one of their partners who said to me, he said, oh, I like a lot of your material. He said, but the one flaw you have in that, he says, is that you keep using the word work. <laughs> so what do you mean? He says, oh no, that's a very unattractive word to use. <laughs> so, oh, well that's, that's odd because it's actually right at the centre of everything that I'm concerned with. That what is our work? And the two from the winter schools, two simple questions that I ask going into the, any organisation, two really simple but powerful questions. First of all is, what is the work? Just ask a simple question. What am I meant to do? What is my work? Or what is the work? And who's meant to be doing what? There's a lot of, a lot of if you do surveys in organisations, what's the number one thing that comes up in all surveys that you should improve? Communication. Communication, yeah. What does that mean? It's always predictable. I've never come across an organisation with a communication problem. 
Seriously. If you think about it, if the head of your organisation was suddenly sacked tomorrow, how long would it take for everyone to know? <laughs> okay? All right. There isn't a problem in communication. The problem is understanding whose work it is to do what. Who's meant to communicate what to who? And sometimes people don't know it's their work. People don't realise that, that there is something to communicate or that I might be interested in that. Okay, so I'm a bit unashamed about looking at work because I do believe that the way that we organise has a huge impact on our behaviour, positive or negative. When I first started my career um, in, in psychology, I worked in the very large mental hospitals. Um, first of all, in the art north of London, and then in the, with the Orwell strategy. And uh, eventually was involved in the closure of those hospitals and the <coughs> development of community services, some of which you'll be involved in providing help for, for people with uh, mental health issues. But what I learned when I started in that, uh, that sector was that going into the hospitals, as a psychologist, the one-to-one -one work wasn't going to make any difference at all. That actually the way the, the organisation was set up and structured drove the behaviour in the organisation. And in fact, we ended up calling them madness factories. And if anybody, any of us had been in there, if some of you had the behaviour was quite predictable given the way that those organisations were set up and what they were run for. And the other thing that's absolutely central to the work that we do is being clear about your purpose. So another, another small uh, little technique that we use in an organisation is about clarity of purpose. Think about your own organisation. Could you describe the purpose of your own organisation in a single sentence without an and? Could you describe your role in an organisation, what you're doing, in a single sentence without an and? Okay, because that's part of the problem that I've found in a lot of organisations is that people are not necessarily very clear or crystal clear about what it is they're meant to be doing. And, and how that contributes to, connects to the purpose of the organisation. And that varies hugely in the organisation. But a lot of conflicts and a lot of problems in organisations are, from my point of view, not personality issues at all. They are misunderstandings about work and authority in an organisation where there is lack of... Either I, I think I have certain authority and you don't, or vice versa, or I thought that that was my work to do and you thought that was your work to do, or neither of us thought it was our work to do. And my experience over the years is that that clears up about 90% of problems, problems in organisations, looking at the clarity around work and the clarity around authorities. In, in the organisation. Systems leadership is really about looking at the entirety of the organisation, not just one part of it. And we'll come back to that in, in, a, in a moment. Because what I want to do is just very quickly give you an overview of systems leadership, but then focus on two core models, which I hope you might be able to, um, to use or begin to, to help you think about some of the issues in your own organisation. But what we're trying to do is look at sustainable improvement. That is many organisations, um, I've also worked in and think about your own experiences too, the excellent practice, you'll find excellent practice but it's often associated with a person. And particular organisations that have charismatic leaders who do inspire people and, and I'm not uh, criticising that, but the unfortunate thing is that when those people go, you'll see a dip in performance in the organisation. And the organisation becomes too dependent on particular individuals. Because actually when they leave, then 
the systems involved, that they, are, they haven't articulated the structures and the systems to keep that work going when they've, when they've left the organisation. Um, it's interesting, who, who's one of the, who are famous charismatic leaders in this country at the moment? Who's a charismatic business leader? Any <coughs> names come to mind? Yeah, Richard Branson, yeah. So that's fairly typical, but it's very interesting. I worked, um, in, was involved in the uh, setup of an um, Australian airline called Virgin Blue, which is the domestic airline in Australia, which is part of the brand. Actually, Branson's organisation is full of systems, and they're very, very focused on the way that they set up and run things and the clarity of work. And although it's a, a charismatic-led organisation, it is underpinned by significant clarity in the organisation around roles and, and systems in the organisation. And absolutely clear on purpose. So their purpose statement with the airline was to make every flight an enjoyable experience for the uh, passenger. And everything was focused on that very, very clear focus and all the systems and the design and the stories around that that will tell you, which are really interesting actually in terms of that. The other thing that, if, if you do have a coherent model of looking at organisations, then you start having the benefit of foresight. That is, you can actually use it predictively. Part of the problem, you know when you hear um, something goes wrong and then somebody brushes that aside because they say, oh, well, with the benefit of hindsight. But actually, if you do the analysis using a lot of these models, you actually have a benefit of foresight. And if you think about when, when people talk about unintended consequences, it's usually because the analysis or the anticipation and the planning has been poor. Okay? So... Well, if you take uh, obvious examples worldwide, like, well, you take unfortunate situations like well, if you go and invade another country, then what's the plan once you've done that? What do you think is going to happen? Do you think that that could not have been anticipated? Well, uh, quite a lot of people did anticipate some of those things. If you make certain changes in, in organisations, you can actually use these models to predict how people... Might, might react. Some of our models apply to all types of organisations and, and others to some. So we come back to being absolutely clear about what the purpose of the organisation is. And I'm talking now about all, all types of social organisation. I work across all, all fields, the public sector, and voluntary sector, private sector and, and many other in religion and, and whole range, anyway. But if you look at what the purpose of the organisation is, then the question is, are, are you there to produce goods or services, which is a very particular type of organisation, and then a meritocracy, we would argue that the way that you run that organisation should be based on a meritocracy. Anybody know what a meritocracy is? What, what, what comes to your mind? Anybody? What's a meritocracy? Pardon? Absolutely. Spot on. Yeah, that's right. It's where the, your ability to do the work is the primary criterion. Yeah? So if, you're, if you have some work to do, you're selecting somebody who you believe can do that work. Yeah? That's really at the heart of it. Has anybody ever found one? Because, I, I, no, seriously, I never have. I've never found a meritocracy. In an organ I've found organisations that try to build a meritocracy and try very hard to do it. I've never found one that actually has completely succeeded where all of their structures and systems are based on merit. And we'll, I'm not going to go through a lot of this in terms of uh, the detail behind it because I'm actually running some workshops later today, tomorrow, around these topics. But just have a think about, exactly as you said, people are chosen because they're capable of doing the work. 
as opposed to other things. And all of those systems I find in other organisations, either deliberate or, or in effect, that people assume that seniority, that's a, if somebody is more senior, that, that they, are, they may be able to do the work. Why? Well, actually, I find that more attractive as I get older. But <laughs> seniority systems are introduced only because they are easily measurable. That you've done so many years, you can count that. And actually, they are usually built in because people are anxious <coughs> about favouritism. That people are getting jobs, you know, all that, that old question about it's, it's not what you know, but who you know in an organisation or because people are related. Um, last week I was working in India and I didn't realise actually that there was, that some of those Indian companies, you probably won't have heard of them, but they're really huge. And the reason that you don't hear much about them, the huge companies, because they're private companies and they're family owned. And one of the c companies, this is $60 billion company, and the big issue there is that the chairman of the company, who's, who's getting older, he's got to choose between one of the family members as who's to be the, who is to be the managing director. Completely different system and concerns about, you know, if you take something like the Murdoch News International, where the, where the family populate those roles. There are different considerations that we bring. The other thing I think about is your experiences as well, consider your experiences, and this is a bit of a simplistic thing, but just in terms of whether you're working in a meritocracy or a royal court, where the royal court, which is actually about the purpose is to please the boss, is to please the leader, and that's all that matters. And in those organisations where you get cliques, you get things coming in and out of fashion and so on, and, and backbiting, as opposed to where you're working in a meritocracy, but that does requ require significant clarity in roles. And that's hard work to do that. It's also, um, the first one is much more attractive in a general sense because as with Game of Thrones or any of those historical stories, a lot of entertainment is based on intrigue. Right? A lot of popular entertainment, we're fascinated. We are very drawn, if we're not careful, to who's in and who's out, and, and who's in favour and who's not in favour, and uh, telling the stories about sudden falls from grace and so on. So it can be quite exciting, but also you can get your head cut off at any, any one time. Meritocracy might be a little bit boring, but it is more effective in getting some work done, which I think is, is closer to our purpose. But I think it's just important to realise that actually, historically, we haven't been organised like this for very long. What's, it, what's our primary form of organisation, of social organisation for human beings? What's our primary attachment? Hmm? Family, yeah. Yeah, historically, blood relation is the strongest tie. And even if you think in modern uh, societies nowadays with large organisations, public, private sector, and so on, where we spend a lot of our time, we still assume primacy of family. If you, just a very simple thing. Anybody in this room, any of us, if we're in the workplace and we get, we get uh, a message that a member of our family is ill, has suddenly been taken ill, what would you do? Huh? Yeah, I mean, if you went, say you went to your boss and you said, look, I've just heard so-and-so has been taken to hospital, would you expect, there's no clicker buttons for this, but your boss to say, A, oh, I'm very sorry, as soon as you finish that report that you're writing, please go, or B, <laughs> well, get get off to the hospital right away. We just assume that's the case. We organise very differently around different... But our family, it's not a meritocracy. The way that we organise ourselves in other situations is quite different. 
and, and appropriately so if you think about the purpose of the organisation. And it would be odd to, to swap them across. So again, those of you with children, if I asked, okay, how did you get them? Who advertised? <laughs> uh, did, you, did you write, what was, what was your job description for that? Have any of you had to let some go? <laughs> Poor performance. <laughs> job descriptions. It might sound good, but it actually, well, I found it doesn't work at all. It, so what, what we are up against if we're trying to build meritocracies are very different forms of organisations. And again, we'll have a workshop on this, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time. But I just don't want to underestimate that it is hard work to build a meritocracy, to focus on the work and to focus on capability. Because there are those other, other forms. Just very, very quickly, if, if you add meritocracy to that and you look at conflict that's happening in the world, you see that certain societies are organised more or less in those terms. So having worked quite a bit in the Middle East as well, then you realise that the Middle East... what can, which, which two do you think dominate in the Middle East? The top two. Top two, yeah? And yet, in Western, we're, Western organisations are more around democracy and meritocracy. And they just don't blend that easily. And if you really want to upset somebody, then in, from coming from those, those backgrounds, then explain to them how my way is much better than yours. So put that to one side, please. It's not that simple. So we've got some design principles around that, you, that we've mentioned already with regard to that. And as I say, if you start muddling up those structures and systems, as, as somebody once said uh, with regard to their business, gave a talk and <laughs> said, I want you all to think, this is the business, I want you all to think of, of this business as a family. So half of you won't be speaking to each other, <laughs> and most will be wondering who's going to get my inheritance. <laughs> okay. It is, I know we use those terms, and we sometimes use them with good intent, but be careful about muddling up these different types of organisation. Talk about clarity, we don't actually have a definition of work. If I, if I was to ask you the definition of work in terms of physics, Probably some people here would know. But the simple definition is force times distance, but it doesn't matter. Because you could go look it up, look it up any way you like. But there isn't a definition of work that is shared. What's work? So we actually offer one which is work is turning intention into reality. And so work is about the how. Anybody in this room, when Hugh was talking about vision and mission statements, and I've worked with plenty of organisations that spend a lot of time uh, talking about the, their vision statement, their mission statement. And as one person put it uh, about the vision statement they had in the organisation, a couple of stories actually, one, one was a vision statement that said, we want this company, we want you to feel that you own this company. And uh, underneath somebody had written on a sign, it was going to said, but please don't take it home bit by bit. <laughs> and, but with those, and another person, the vision statement, and his comment was a very good one, which was, a vision statement without a plan is an hallucination. Okay? So what we're on about is how you turn that into reality. You could sit here, and it, it's, it's not useless work to do, but you could sit down and, and describe how you would like your organisation to be. You could, anybody could come up here and probably make a speech about what they would like their organisation to be like. The work is actually making that happen, making that real. How do you actually turn that into reality? And for human beings, that's about making decisions. So what I'd suggest is that the heart of whatever it is you're doing is decision making. That's what you pay a human being to do. And that, to me, is the difference between human work and machine work. Because a machine doesn't make decisions. And it's interesting, having worked in Russia, 
their view of work is a lot more authoritarian than ours is in terms of not making decisions. A couple of points on that. So, if, but you can hear that. Anybody speak Russian? If, but the word for work in, in Russia is robotnya, which is the root of robot. So it's much more a, 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 means, a means to an end but where you're under instruction. Whereas I think our sense of work is, is the decision making that you have to make, the decisions that you have to make in order to get your work done in an organization. That's why you pay a human being. And by definition, you will never know what would have happened if you'd done something else. Okay? That's never actually knowable. And so all you have to go on is your sense of judgment and what it is you use to inform your judgment. Now, that involves clearly a lot of relationships that we have in organisations of how you make <coughs> decisions in relation to other people and the nature of authority that you have to make decisions in an organisation. And when you're talking about authority and accountability, if you're working in an organisation, and after all, if you're getting paid, then it's quite reasonable to think that you might have to give an account about what it is you're doing and, and how well you're going. But that, that, author that must be matched with authority. And one of the problems that I've seen also, uh, partly in, in public sector as well, is that it is unclear at times what authority people actually have with regard to others. And so we have to rely upon certain personal qualities of persuasion and then we get into who can be more influential than others and then that can actually start to distort the organisation. Uh, so work turning intention into reality but you have to have the authority in order to do that. I just want to offer a couple of models um, behind all of this that you might find helpful in thinking about organisations. We're proposing something quite unusual at, but starts off with a very usual statement and that, that human beings are, are, are values driven and I don't think that was, that's a very contentious point of view. If you don't value your work, if you don't value the situation that you're in, then I wouldn't expect you to be putting a huge amount of effort in. That you wouldn't be doing the work, working productively to your potential. So in order, our view is we have to understand in organisations of how people assign value to behaviour. What behaviour is actually valued. And the proposition that we have, that we start with systems leadership, which is right at the heart, <coughs> Is, is an unusual one in that it says, you've heard the phrase that people have different values. Yeah? People, people say, our proposition is that no, we don't have different values. That all human beings share the same values. And that comes across all of those, those organisational um, types. And we base it on a fundamental values continuum, which is those six core values. And this isn't a matter of choice. What we're saying is that if we are going to be socially cohesive, the definition of a socially cohesive group, that is a group that actually continues to work productively together, at the heart of that, then if I want to be a part of that group, I must behave towards you in ways that you regard are trustworthy, loving, honest, fair, courageous, and dignifying or respectful. Okay? Dignity or respect is fine at the bottom. If I start to behave in ways that you regard as negative of one or more of those values, <coughs> then I start to get into trouble and the group starts to lose cohesion. Okay? This isn't a matter of choice, what this proposition. This isn't the same as what Hugh was talking about, your organisational values that you choose to have. This is saying, under, underlying those, and actually you did have some of those in there, is saying this is how we operate. This is how we operate. 
And what you see here is a fundamental notion of us and them. Because we are like that. And they are like that. And you see that so commonly in... What, what's the most obvious example of that? Political parties. If somebody wants you to join their group, what do they say? You could trust us. We really are terribly concerned about you. And uh, we'll tell you the truth. We'll make the... Well, people talk about fairness all the time. You know, we'll make the fair decisions. That's how, they're, that's how they're arguing all the time. That's us over there. Whereas they, not very trustworthy, are they? They're not really concerned about you. Uh, they're not going to tell you the truth. Look at the policies. Oh, my goodness. And so on. Both sides are saying the same to each other, about each other. The other thing is that as human beings, we cannot live comfortably if we have a self-image which is negative here. So if I, if I say to you right now, put your hand up if you're inherently dishonest. <laughs> oh, come on, there must be some. <laughs> you know, it's very, it's, yes, you must be telling lies. So <laughs> it's very <coughs> fundamental to us also to experience that in our relationships. And when, we, when our behaviour is called negatively, that's extremely uncomfortable it, of, of how we deal with that. Okay? And if you want to start thinking about your organisations, it's a very simple way to think and talk, talk to people. I don't talk about doing big surveys or anything. But just when I go around, we do something... Um, called the Systems and Symbols Audit. We go into organisations and we just talk to people. And one of the things we talk about, it's a bit like what you were saying, Hugh, as well. Um, what, do you th what do you like about working in this organisation? Give me an example of, of something that you think is fair or unfair or courageous. Or, or because the, the point is, it's not the values that are different. It is what we think represents those values in terms of behaviour. So if I, give you a if I give you an example, I do quite a bit of cross-cultural work between organisations that would be um, uh, in conflict. So I work with Aboriginal communities and mining companies, for example. And one of the places that I, that I worked with, um, with using this was... A, Far North Queensland is a, is a mining town and there's only one place where the Aboriginal community and the, and the essentially white Australian community come together and that's the shopping centre. So I'm talking to people about saying, what's your problem? Why, why, do, why is there conflict between these two groups? And the, some of the, the white groups said, well, the problem is, you see, that uh, people, the, the Aboriginal people, they don't love their children. It's an issue of love because they... And if you go to the show, what, so what, why, how can you say that? Oh, let me tell you, let me give you an example. I'll give you an example. At the shopping centre, when you see the, the families, they pay no attention to their children whatsoever. The adults talk to them, the children run around, and they do. They do run around. And see, so that they're, they're completely, they couldn't care less about their kids. So I uh, well, asked the Aboriginal people, and they said, well, the problem with the white people is that they're so unloving to their children. What? Well, have you seen them at the shopping centre? They're controlling them all the time. They shout at them. They tell them not to touch things. You know, how, how horrible is that? Okay, so it wasn't... If you, then I said, look, are you serious? Are you really serious that you think one group actually loves their children and the other doesn't? So... It's not a question of, of that. It's a question of what behaviour do you think represents that? And for in, those of you who may know anything about traditional cultures like that, um, actually that have rites of passage, you don't actually control your children very much in their first 10, 11 years of life anyway. They do pretty much what they like. <coughs> and with extended families, they've got rights to go and live with whoever they want as well, with their aunties and their uncles. So... 
it's a very different set of expectations and behaviours around that. And, but if you take that into the workplace, you think about what behaviours do you recognise as being fair or honest or loving in your organisation. Because what I find interesting and what we're discovering, what we're trying to do, is to understand the mythologies in an organisation. And it sounds a bit of an awkward word, but actually the real definition of a mythology is something that is told as if it's a story that's told as if it is true. And it's a combination of mythos and logos, which is reason and emotion. And to me, leadership is about the synthesis of emotion and rationality. So if you're in a leadership role, then it, what we're saying is that it is not sufficient for you to lead by just on the basis of here's a, here's a reasoned argument. This is why we should do it. Hugh, I'm sure that uh, the fire brigade at the moment, the fire service, the pensions. What's the reason for cutting it? Right? There's, you can put up, a, a fire brigade pensions are under significant threat of being changed. It's an emotional issue as well. It's not just here, this is all we can afford. Oh, okay, thank you very much. Now you've explained that, I'm okay with it. Yeah, great. So it is a combination. And what we're saying is that you should neither drive solely on emotion, because that's the charismatic leadership that is almost a mindless following. I'll just do it because of my emotional attachment to you. I don't really understand why I'm doing it. And, and the, so the emotional attachment and, and the reason that you won't convince people with pie charts and, and PowerPoints and so on, however true they are, however accurate they are. And that an organisation's reputation is understood by the stories that are told about it. Okay, so think about what are the stories that you, that are currently told about your organisation by the various stakeholders. Currently, how would people describe your organisation? and you can come back to the, the values and use those. How would they <coughs> describe it? A positively and or, and or negatively, and the different stakeholders, how would they describe the organisation? What behaviours are encouraged and what behaviours are discouraged and seen as positive or negative? So part of the work of leadership, from my point of view, is saying, do you understand the mythologies of the organisation? And they don't necessarily transfer from one to another. Some very different stories told about similar types of organisation. If you look at one, one simple piece of behaviour that is, we talked about communication. Another word, another C word that is used a lot in organisations is collaboration. I think you talked about that yesterday. When you look at the term like collaboration, who thinks that collaboration is, is a bad thing? Anybody? Right. Now if you look in an organisation, our question would be, what are the stories around collaboration? So, for example, I've been in organisations where people say things like, yeah, it's all right, they encourage it, but if you give up your time to help somebody else from another team, you don't get anything back for it. You don't get any recognition. And in fact, you're probably doing yourself down. There's a different context uh, when I was, that one which was um, explained when I was working in Russia, which was a fortune, a good fortune working in Siberia in a city called Krasnyask, which is a closed, was a closed city under the Soviets. And collaboration, there was no collaboration in the Russian system. It's highly authoritarian. And so I asked the, the, um, I asked the managing director of the company, we'd done a lot of restructuring and rework, but people were still not working together very effectively. And everything was still done through the boss. And I remember him saying to me, he said, uh, well, you must understand that if you question boss, then you may lose job, you may lose your home, you may be put in jail, or you may be shot. <laughs> This does not encourage collaboration. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so it's, 
And it was true. <laughs> you know, so what's happening in the organisation? So the other thing is that when people tell stories, tell the mythologies, that's the binding essence of the culture. That's what our cultures are about. Because cultures are formed when people share those stories. And share, I mean, they agree with the same view. They agree which behaviours demonstrate po positive or negative values. We are inherently drawn to people who see the world in the same way that we do. Right, why would that be? Because if somebody sees the world the same way that you do, they're clearly highly intelligent <laughs> and sensitive and correct. So, of course, we are drawn to people. If at the end of this session, you go out and you have a cup of coffee and you think it's been a real hour and a half of waste of your time, then you will want to find people who agree with you. If you go up to somebody and say, what did you think <coughs> of that? So, oh, it was, wasn't it brilliant? Oh, oh, I'll have to go and look for somebody else. <laughs> um, what did you think? I thought it was good. Hmm. Oh, well, I didn't think much. No, I didn't. No, I, I, I thought it was awful too. Yes, I did. And, and you, you start, you see, that's how the cultures form around who agrees with whom about something. Now, as a leader in an organisation, you will create a culture. It's just a question of whether it's the culture you want and whether you're doing it deliberately. Because people will have views about you, about the organisation, about their colleagues and so on. So the question is, are you building a culture around what you want to be positive, and that doesn't cover everything, but those aspects of the workforce, or is it just growing randomly in the organisation? And so I just want to finish with uh, this, this one. There's a lot more about systems, and as I say, there's workshops that we can run if people are interested in underlying these. But just as a summary, it's saying, you probably can't see the well that line, there's a line from start to the goal. So what we're trying to do in an organisation, and anybody can have this, this set of, of slides by the way if you, if you want them, that's alright Joe isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So what we're saying, and this is about primarily around a meritocracy, is saying do you have a clear description of what you really want in your organisation? And I don't mean vague terms like where everybody works well together. W quite specifically, one of the things I ask people in organisations is, if I came into your organisation in, and it was working exactly how you would like it to work, what would I see? Literally, what would I see? How would, I, how would people behave towards me? Really concrete stuff. You know, so not, not vague general vision mission statements. What sort of stories would you like to be told about your organisation? Just tell me, what, what, would, what would clients, what would service users, what would they be saying about your organisation if it was running how you want? So instead of sort of general statements, just spend a bit of time thinking quite specifically about that. And then think about, right, where are we at the moment? What are people saying now, inside and outside the organisation? What are some of the stories that are told? What are some of the behaviours that I see? I work with um, uh, organisations, particularly in education at the moment, I'm doing some work with uh, the, on the Torres Straits, which is between Australia and Papua New Guinea. And there they have, it's, it's lovely, it's like one college, it, well, it was about putting this college together, a college called Tagai College. And it's, it's in geographically, it's the largest school campus in the world. And they have uh, 18 schools on 17 different islands. It's a beautiful location. So in some of the little, little schools on some of the islands, there are only 12, 12 students in the school. And the, the secondary school is about 1,200. But... They use this all the time in terms of trying to create one sense of what's the college about, the clear purpose of providing the best education for the children. And there's even different languages on some of the islands. 
So they've got geographical uh, dispersion, they've got different languages and so on, but they have a very clear purpose and they have a very clear idea and it varies according where they are now. But then under, underlying that is saying, if you want your organisation to be like this, then why do you think, examine your systems, in the, and I don't, as Joe said earlier, I'm not talking about systems, I mean any, any way in which you do your work, not IT, I'm not talking about those, any, you're talking about recruitment, selection, promotion, uh, performance management, any system in your organisation. Why do you think that doing something like that will lead to this behaviour? Right. If people are behaving like that now, if Hugh's driving around with a driver and a chauffeur sitting in the back of his Bentley with rose petals being strewn in front of him as, as he turns up at a fire station, if he behaves like that, is that likely to encourage this? And what about the symbols that you're using in the organisation, again, that you use with the, the back? What do they mean? Are they seen positively or negatively? I worked in a uh, New South Wales coal mine and uh, the, the organisations there, they're very, very militant, or well, militant, the very strong union representation. But the owners change, the owners change. What happens when an organisation changes ownership? First thing they do is you know, change all the logos, all the, you know, the name and so on. So the new general manager of the mine, he decided that he would give every miner uh, a baseball cap. They were nice actually, they were good quality stuff, with the <coughs> new company logo on the baseball cap. And, and shift change, he, had, he personally handed everybody one of these, uh, one of these caps. And when I drove into the, to the mine uh, after the shift change, along, on the, the road into the, into the main entrance, either side of the road was just caps, baseball caps. And as they left, they'd just thrown them out the window of their utes, just thrown them out. So I asked, it got them quite well, and so I said, why'd you do that? I thought they were quite good caps. And this guy said to me, he says, you're not buying me with a baseball cap. You know, it's, it was just a symbol on its own. So what we're trying to look at here, and what the systems leadership modelling is fundamentally about, is the integration and the connection of those three together. And that's the whole point, okay? Because what I'm saying is that if you rely on behaviour alone, you know, and there will, there's a lot of exhortation about, you, about how you can behave differently and how other people can behave differently as individuals. There's nothing wrong with that, but all I'm saying is that that won't be sufficient. If you just change the systems in, and you don't worry too much about the behaviour, for example, or the symbols, that will be insufficient. If you don't pay attention to symbols in organisations, then that will not help you, or if you just pay attention to symbols, we describe that simply as cosmetic, don't we? You know, it just, it look, yeah, so paint, just, it's just a paint job. Somebody has just done a few things to make it look better. And as you said, Hugh, there's plenty of organisations when the, when the bosses come round, everything's cleaned up and tidied up, uh, but that's not how it, how it is normally. So what we're saying here is that the leadership of an organisation, the work of the leadership, is to integrate the behaviour systems and symbols together in order to create the organisation that you want and make sure that they are aligned together. And behind all of that is a very strong message about the clarity of the work and the authority that goes with that work. Okay, I think that's, that'd probably be enough for now, Joe. Is that all right? There, there are, there's are some other materials about systems and how you design those systems and so on. But there, as I say, there's other workshops. Um, so, thank you, Hugh. <laughs>